Just the other day, I sold my 1976 240D to an enthusiast in Idaho, and so I'm now going to offer my next project car for sale. Now, I know some of you are saying, hey, Ken, are you retiring? In fact, I've received numerous emails over the last two months because I'm selling off a number of my cars that people are thinking I'm going to retire. <laughs> It's all over, okay? Well, not so. I'm not planning to retire anytime soon, but let's face it, I'm going to be 70 years old here in a couple months. And, you know, I just don't have the energy to take care of all the cars I own. Now, I've had a number of emails asking, can you give me a list of all the cars you own? Well, I, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. If I did, then you would realize why, okay, I understand now, Kent, why you're going to sell off some of these cars and you're not going to be able to complete them. And this is one of them right here, a 1981 240D. There's a story in this car. Bear with me, I want to share that story with you. The year was 1980. You know, that's 36 years ago. And I just returned from New Guinea after being out there flying as a bush pilot for eight years. And I went to the Pomona Swap Meet. This is that big car swap meet that was held in Southern California in the winter. And I can remember walking by a Mercedes just like this. It was a white 240D with blue interior. And it was the very first time in my life that I really noticed Mercedes from a design standpoint, okay? And I remember walking around the car and I said, wow, this is really a handsome car. And I couldn't believe it. You know, I'd never really seen one before. Of course, I had been, you know, <laughs> at the ends of the earth <laughs> during the development of this car and when it was introduced in the U.S. market in 1977. But the one for sale was a 1979 model. Um, it was a 240D automatic, but it was just gorgeous, white, and like I say, with navy, and he won't, the price tag said 11400 I remember thinking, man, that's pretty expensive <laughs> for a car back in, a used car, by the way, back in 1980. But just a few years ago, when I had a chance to pick up this one, all those memories came back, and I said, okay, I'm going to get a 240D, and I'm going to restore it, like, you know, quote, unquote, brand new. And it had to fit a few criteria. Number one, it had to be a four-speed manual. Number two, of course, it had to have all the simplicity of a 240D, including no sunroof, hand crank windows, and of course, manual climate control, which these all had. But I'm not alone in my opinion that this is possibly one of the best, if not the best car ever made of all time. Now you're gonna say, well, Kent, how can you say that? Well, once again, it's an opinion, but it's based on a bunch of criteria, not just looks, not just speed. Obviously, if you were going by speed, this wouldn't be the best of all time. But when you take into account reliability, drivability, maintenance costs, uh, comfort, and you just go on and on down the line, including how attractive the cars were at this time, you know, the 240D four-speed manual could indeed be <laughs> that car. And of course, that's what I wanted to do. But I have one pet peeve with these cars, by the way, and that is that the gearing's too low. So when you get out on the freeway, you know, and you're cruising along at 70 miles an hour, it is really busy. That engine is loud. So being a four-speed, you can, of course, put a different rear end in it. You can put a lower ratio rear end in the car. And of course, that's what I was going to do with this car. I have a 3.07 rear end. This is out of a 84 300D turbo diesel. You could even find one out of a 1985 model that had 2.88, which would even be better. And I know some of you are gonna say, oh, Kent, but that's gonna affect the low end power. Well, come on. Have any of you driven a 240D four speed? How far do you go in first gear? You may go 20 feet, unless of course you're going uphill but you have to shift almost immediately. So by putting a lower ratio rear end in these cars, you actually have a better driving, nicer handling, smoother shifting car that gets better fuel economy with less noise, okay? And if you don't believe it, I'm gonna put a link uh, below in the show more part of the description, take you back to a modification I made in a W108 six cylinder that I put a 4.5er in that car also had a manual transmission. And watch this video and you'll become a believer that if you have a four speed manual, you can do wonders by lowering the rear end ratio on almost any of these older 
Mercedes Benzes. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this car because I am going to be selling it. I'm not going to be doing any more work on it. I have not done any work on it, so I'm, I want to make that very clear right at the beginning. This is not a car that I fixed up. This is not a car that Kent's gone through. You're not expecting something that's restored here. This is pretty much as I purchased it, I think uh, three, three or four years ago, and it's sat around here. I've started up and run it. Always starts. Starts is beautiful. I want you to check out the engine right now because that's one of the important things when you get one of these old diesels. Once again, I don't know anything about the history of this engine. I don't know if it's even the original engine in the car. It acts like a, a replacement engine because with, let's say, 250,000 miles plus, this thing just starts and runs much better than most engines with that kind of mileage. Particularly, you let this engine sit for a couple months, it just comes in and fires right up, even in the middle of winter. So it's always been a really good starter, as I've had it stored around here for a few years. But let me go ahead and start it up now and I'll let you hear the authority with which it starts and how abruptly it shuts off. Those are kind of good signs that it's a, it's a strong engine. You can see there it hardly turned over a couple times before it fired right up. It's a nice sound at high idle. So I'm not going to be able to tell you all the things that you might need to do with this engine because you know I haven't done uh, valve adjustment, I have not done anything with the fuel injectors, haven't done anything with timing uh, uh, on the injection pump. So I just want to clarify that if you're actually interested in owning and finishing this project. Now let's hear this thing shut down. I've often said in my other videos, when you shut down an engine, if it shuts down abruptly, that's a really good sign it's a tight diesel. Okay, it's shut right down. It looks like the shutoff valve is working okay. But my recommendation, if you get this engine, of course, you'll want to give it a full service, which means checking everything over as, as I've laid out in my manuals and videos, probably going through the injectors, checking uh, valve adjustment timing and so on. So there it is, 240D four speed. One of those engines that I consider one of the best automotive diesels ever made of all time. So the engine appears to be okay. I can't verify that it's going to be something that's going to go for hundreds of thousands of more miles. But that's what you're going to get. Now let's take a look at the interior because that's going to need a little help. Now the interior is nothing to write home about, but I've seen worse. This is actually a car with original black interior, but notice I put some blue seats in the front. The black seats were heavily deteriorated on the springs and cushions. So at least I have a couple seats in here which are comfortable to sit in and drive the car until you complete the restoration. But there are cracks in the dash and there are wrinkles in the door panels. So this is by no means a show quality interior. This gives new meaning to the expression black and blue because this car is black and blue, by the way. Notice the original black rear seat as it contrasts with the navy front seats. I've also mixed carpets. We got blue uh, carpets on the floors because they were in better condition than the original black ones. But one of the primary reasons I picked up this particular car other than the fact that it was a four-speed is because of the condition of the body. Now granted there are a few dents in it and I know by cleaning the car that the two doors here on the right side have been repainted. Everything else appears to be original paint by the way. There's you know a few like I say little dings, there's a few little kind of surface rust spots, but look at the quarter panels. Look at those rocker panels and the jack points. Those are the areas you want to look at in these W123s. Determine whether or not they've ever been subjected to road salt or whether they have rust problems because I did not want to start with any W123 that had any evidence of rust caused by exposure to road salt. I'm sorry. I just, I don't mess around with cars that have Salt rust. You want to know why? Because what you see is just the tip of the rust berg. You get into some of these cars that have been in the rust belt or maybe been up in Canada driven in, in uh, the winter with road salt and let me tell you, 
you're going to have some surprises, I can guarantee it. So this was one of the big reasons, you know, as a great, straight, really tight body. You know, when I said I was going to restore this, I mean really restore it. That means, you know, new paint job, uh, redo the interior, probably trying to find a good interior from another W123. And, of course, probably taking the engine out and overhauling it. Now, the owner had done some work just before I got the car, and that's he'd pulled the transmission, replaced the clutch and pressure plate, and the, I think he replaced the master and slave cylinders. I'm not 100% sure, but he'd also put some uh, rebuilt calipers on it, so the brakes and the clutch and everything are great in this car. Now, if any of you are really interested in this car, I do have a low mileage. This is a 180,000-mile short block, 240D short block with new pistons, new liners, all the gaskets. And it would probably be pretty easy to load that, those parts up in the car if you were to have this car trailer to your location. Now, I'm going to recommend, if you're interested in purchasing this car, that you don't plan to pick it up and drive cross-country. I do not know how well this is, car is going to handle on a long trip. I, like I say, I've just pretty much driven it out locally here and around the farm for the last three or four years. I've not taken it on any long road trips. So I would be the last person to recommend that you should just, oh, I'm going to fly out and see Kent and drive this car back to, you know, Minnesota or something. No, have it trucked, okay? That's the safest way to go with these old cars that you don't really know that much about. But I do want to say that as a special bonus, if you do purchase this car, you're going to get the, the 3.07 rear end. Uh, I'll throw that in on the deal. If you're interested in the engine overhaul parts, you know, you can email us and I'll tell you about pricing and how we would arrange that and so on and so forth. There is one thing I do want you to understand in closing. You know, if you're interested in purchasing this car, uh, don't have too high expectations. I can't guarantee anything. This is kind of one of those cars that what you see is what you get and it's sold as is. There's no warranty implied, no warranties expressed. I can't verify a lot of these things on this car because I've not really worked on it. Okay, other than keep it washed and keep it running on a regular basis over the last few years. So if you're interested in learning more about this, I'll put some more information on my website along with the price. And you can contact us through the contact section of our website if you're interested in learning anything more about it or if you're interested in purchasing it. I just realized I forgot to mention a couple things. You know, the odometer is showing... 224,000 miles, but I believe it's got more than that. And the previous owner also concurs because the odometer has worked on and off for the last few years. I'm not sure if the odometer is even working at this point, but I do not know the actual mileage. But the car does drive quite well. Of course, there's looseness in the steering box, about what you'd find normal with a 123, but it shifts good. Uh, there's no adverse whine in the gearbox. It goes through all four gears real smoothly. It does have a problem with the reverse lockout in the shifter. In other words, uh, you know, it's supposed to have a lock mechanism there, so when you pull it over uh, to, fir to find first, it doesn't go into reverse. Something's wrong in the shift mechanism, so it, you can pull it all the way over into reverse without lifting the knob up. So that's going to have to be attended to. But the engine produces good power. The transmission shifts well, the car brakes well, so it is drivable. And I've driven it around here locally, but once again, I don't recommend that you would purchase this car and drive it across country. because.